Moving on to six sinus syndrome, our classic patient for this condition is going to be an older patient with multiple comorbidities. These patients classically will have intermittent symptoms. However, the frequency and severity of these symptoms is going to increase over time. These symptoms include dizziness, presyncope or syncope, shortness of breath, especially on exertion, angina, fatigue, and palpitations. In sick sinus syndrome, the pathophysiology is dysfunction of the sinoatrial or SA node. The sinoatrial node, as we know, is located here in the atria and serves as the pacemaker of the heart. However, especially as patients age and this becomes damaged and less functional over time, this can ultimately lead in some cases to the sinoatrial node not firing quickly enough, resulting in bradycardias, or it can fire too much, resulting in various tachycardias, such as atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and PSVT. However, there are several potential underlying causes of this dysfunction of the SA node, including senescence, which is simply damage over time with aging, various medications, ischemia, as well as hypothyroidism. In order to diagnose sick sinus syndrome, the real key is going to be to make an association between the patient's EKG abnormalities and their symptoms. Typically, patients with sick sinus syndrome are going to have severe bradycardia, defined as a heartbeat that is less than 50 beats per minute. In addition to this severe bradycardia, however, patients with sick sinus syndrome classically will also develop various tachyarrhythmias over time. The result of this is that the patient is going to alternate between episodes of bradycardia and episodes of atrial tachyarrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and PSVT. And as you will notice here, these tachyarrhythmias are all originating above the ventricle as this is ultimately a disease of the sinus or sinoatrial node. Therefore, it should not be surprising to us that the tachyarrhythmias we see include AFib, a flutter, and PSVT. In addition to the use of an EKG in our patients with sick sinus syndrome, in the setting of outpatient cardiology, you may also see some clinicians order a Holter monitor, which allows us to monitor our patient's rhythm over the course of 24 hours. Because an EKG is really just a snapshot in time of just about 10 seconds, a Holter monitor over the course of 24 hours can be much more helpful in helping us to identify these bradycardias and atrial tachyarrhythmias in our patients. As we stated previously, in the case of sick sinus syndrome, we will ideally be able to see alternating bradycardia and tachyarrhythmias. So if we were to assume that this EKG is a 10 second snapshot, we can first count up the number of QRS complexes and then multiply this number by six. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight QRS complexes. If we multiply eight by six, as this is a 10 second strip, and there are six units of this 10 second strip in a 60 second period or per minute, and this is ultimately going to give us 48 beats per minute, which is therefore bradycardia. Other than knowing that this is a bradycardia, this rhythm strip is actually really beyond the scope of what you will need to know for the USMLE as well as your shelf examinations as this happens to be an AV junctional rhythm. You can see over here in this second complex here that prior to the QRS we are negative in lead one and positive in AVR which is an atypical extrasystole beat. Regardless, however, we can appreciate from this EKG that for this patient they are having an episode of bradycardia. We now have an EKG taken from the same patient at a different point in time, and we can see here that this patient is experiencing tachycardia. If we count up the number of QRS complexes in this patient's EKG strip, we can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And if we multiply 21 by 6, once again, because there are six units of this 10 second strip in a minute, then we will get 126 beats per minute. Additionally, we can also appreciate here that this patient has an irregularly irregular rhythm. We can especially appreciate this here on the right hand side of the EKG, 
where we can see that this QRS complex occurs here, followed by a QRS complex here, followed by a QRS complex, which has a wider interval between these QRS complexes, followed by a, a more narrow interval between these QRS complexes, followed by a more wide interval between these QRS complexes. Therefore, we can see an irregularly irregular rhythm, and really it is very difficult. I would really have to try to use my imagination to pick out any P waves here as well, preceding these QRS complexes. So therefore, this EKG is consistent with atrial fibrillation with a high heart rate as well, and therefore this is consistent with the tachyarrhythmias that we would expect to see in sick sinus syndrome. Again, from the same patient who had that bradycardic rhythm on the previous slide, and this is highly characteristic of sick sinus syndrome. In terms of management in our patients with sick sinus syndrome, if they are asymptomatic, then we are going to need to simply address the underlying cause. For some patients, they may simply have this as a result of hypothyroidism or medications, for example, and ultimately we can try to address these underlying causes. However, if the patient is bradycardic and becomes hemodynamically unstable in the context of sick sinus syndrome, then we simply go back to our ACLS bradycardia with pulse algorithm. We first can give the patient atropine 0.5 milligrams, and we are able to repeat this 0.5 milligram dose every three to five minutes, up to three milligrams total. Additionally, if there is no response to atropine, we can perform transcutaneous cardiac pacing, and we could also resort to the use of IV dopamine, epinephrine, as well as isoprotenerol. Although that is the case for our patients who have sick sinus syndrome and are hemodynamically unstable as a result of their bradycardia within this syndrome, if we have a patient who is symptomatic with sick sinus syndrome but is hemodynamically stable, then that patient is going to need a pacemaker as their definitive treatment. We have now mentioned the ACLS bradycardia with pulse algorithm a couple of times throughout this series in the context of unstable sinus bradycardia as well as instability in our patients with sick sinus syndrome. So let's briefly just go through the algorithm as this is something that could show up on examinations, especially in terms of this step here with the atropine, transcutaneous pacing, and dopamine or epinephrine use. However, this is also something that you will see when you are ultimately an intern and get your ACLS training if you haven't already. So first of all, we should assess the patient. We will see that they have a heart rate that is less than 50 beats per minute, and they must have a pulse in order for us to utilize this particular ACLS algorithm. Our first step is going to be to identify and treat the underlying cause. We should maintain the patient airway, give O2 if the patient is hypoxemic, put the patient on a cardiac monitor, continuous blood pressure monitor, as well as a pulse ox. We should try to get peripheral IV access, and if it is available and we can get it quickly, we can get a quick 12 lead EKG. We then must ask the question, does the patient have a persistent bradyarrhythmia that is causing hypotension, altered mental status, signs of shock, ischemic chest pain, or acute heart failure? If the answer to this is no, then we can simply monitor and observe the patient. However, if the answer to this is yes, then we can start first by giving atropine 0.5 milligrams if this is ineffective, we are able to go up ultimately to repeated doses of that 0.5 milligrams up to 3 milligrams. However, if this is ineffective, we can resort to transcutaneous pacing. We can also utilize dopamine or epinephrine. And ultimately, the final step after all of this is to make sure that we get an expert consult, in this case cardiology, as well as in some cases transvenous pacing. However, as we always do at Boards MD, we really want to focus on what you really need to succeed on your USMLE and shelf examinations, and therefore focusing on this piece here, including the atropine and the transcutaneous pacing, is really where the bulk of the action is in terms of maximizing your scores on your examinations. This is Boards MD, and this is sinus bradycardia and sick sinus syndrome. Thank <laughs> you.